Sarah, you're going to be talking this evening about encountering London. Mm. Tell me what it is you've encountered that you would most like to share. Oh, gosh. I mean, it's just been wonderful last six months. So the people, really, I mean, they've been a real joy. But also seeing the opportunity of God's hope in communities and in churches. Uh, so I hope to be able to get over some of that joy that I've seen, whilst recognising life isn't always a breeze for people. And tell me, just how does it feel, surrounded by all these wonderful religious leaders, all of whom are male? Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm used to being surrounded by men, but I think that my real concern is recognising we're going to walk away and we'll leave them here just as men. So those people encountering sort of religion and faith for the first time may actually see that it's only male. So there is a slight concern I have about that, really, about, you know, for them, they may not see who they are here. And that, for me, is slightly sad. It's great that we get to see you tonight. Yeah, well, it's to great change to change that. Great to be here. Thank you. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you to St Martin in the Fields tonight. Special welcome if you're visiting us for the first time for this lecture series. Today we will be encountering London and it gives me very great pleasure to welcome Bishop Sarah Mullally and Bishop Joe Ma Bailey Wells who will be leading us in conversation as they discuss this subject of encountering London as two women leaders we're very grateful for them in the Church of England. Let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Let me introduce to you your bishop here in London. The Right Reverend and Right Honourable Dame Sarah Mullally, DBE, hails from Surrey. That is to say, she grew up in the town of Woking in the Diocese of Guildford. <laughs> we'll be coming back to that. But let me focus on her professional life. She trained as a nurse at the South Bank Poly and worked variously at Tommy's, the Royal Marsden, and Chelsea and Westminster. From 1999 to 2004, she moved into the corridors of Whitehall, serving as Chief Nursing Officer and Director of Patient Experience for England. During the same period, she was training for ordination at the South East Institute for Theological Education, now known as St. Augustine's College, and then serving a curacy, a self-supporting curacy, at Holy Trinity Clapham. Since then, she has served in full-time ministry at St. Saviour's Battersea Fields, St. Nicholas Sutton, Salisbury Cathedral, and in the Diocese of Exeter. Now, she's been taking up the reins as Bishop of London progressively, shall we say. She was announced last December, then elected last January, confirmed last March, it goes on, sorry, <laughs> installed in May, and then she was introduced in the House of Lords also in May, then she gave her first maiden speech June, June yeah. and, and finally today, she's just come from the House of Lords, where she was finally allowed to ask a question. <laughs> wow. And when I say she's progressively taken up the reins in stages, she has yet to move to her formal residence. Such is the speed at which the Church of England gets around to its property. Anyway, to this interview, I'm going to interview you, Sarah, Sarah looking at four levels of encounter. Encountering London, encountering God, encountering church, which is very different, by the way, well, it may be, we'll hear. And then encountering leadership. So first of all, London. Most of your adult life has been spent in London since 18, I think by my reckoning, just six years out of London. So tell us, do you love London? I do, yes, I do. I mean, it's, um, it's, people often think that I was, before this, the Bishop of Crediton, so they often uh, expect me to come as a sort of rural girl, really. 
Um, but in fact, it was only six years away, and um, I just love London. Um, and I guess, um, you know, as, as it was announced in Devon, people said to me, gosh, you will miss uh, the countryside. Um, and actually, I just thought, well, yes, of course I do, but actually I love London, and particularly the people. Uh, and I'm under no illusions, life is tough in London, but there is just something about its diversity. And I guess if we all liked the same place, life would be very boring. Um, so there is a sense to which I feel called back here. And which London? Mm. Because you spent a long time south of the river, and it's a foreign <laughs> country over there, isn't it, to some? <laughs> to St Martin in the Fields, it at is. least. Tell us about yeah. moving, crossing yeah. that bridge. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, you know, I sort of slightly feel, I have to say embarrassingly, I spent most of my time living south of the river. But I did work north of the river. Uh, so I worked at uh, the old Westminster Hospital, at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital on the Fulham Road, the Royal Marsden Hospital, and then in Whitehall, um, the other way, at Richmond House. I've worked north of the river, uh, but I have to admit I've lived uh, south of the river. Um, but the thing you learn about London is it's made up of different villages. So even north of the river, you know, here is very different to going up to Enfield or Willesden. Um, there is something about the variety and the location and place that's important. But I do recognise uh, that whenever you move somewhere new, you have to get to know each community. So whilst I know London, I know I don't lon know London. And it's been great to get to know the communities right across the diocese of London, which are very varied and many. Now, when you were moving to Exeter, I suspect you weren't telling people how much you loved London. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask, as you moved back, did you have any sense of premonition that you would be leaving London for just a few years? Uh, no, I, my expectation was that I would be in Devon and, um, you know, these decisions, when you feel called, you feel called and expect there to be, you know, I thought probably I may well be there for the rest of my ministry. But I was very clear when I went to Devon that I wasn't a country girl, you know, I was an upcountry girl. Uh, and the thing you learn about rural communities, as long as, um, as, long as you're honest, uh, they take you to their heart. And, and I also learned that there, there are some similarities. I mean, I love people. And uh, people are the same all over the place. Uh, and the important thing is to listen to their story. Um, and the other thing I learned was that uh, Devon's made up of villages and so is the city of London. Um, and there's not that much difference sometimes between those little villages in the city, uh, between the villages in remote Devon. Um, and there are huge commonalities. Um, so for me, going to Devon, I mean, they were a great joy and real generosity in accepting me there as an upcountry girl. Uh, and I learned a huge amount for them, really. So I've got some quick fire questions now, some alternatives. Mm. I just want to say, Bishop Sarah, they're not meant to test you <laughs> on your knowledge of London. Good. They're so that we can get to know you. Okay, bus or tube? At tube, but I'd love it to be bus. I was hoping you'd say bike, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, Oxford uh, Street or Portobello Road? At uh, Oxford Street. National Theatre or Bark? National Theatre. Why? Uh, because I just think what they put on there is great, really. Uh, and the truth is I'm probably more familiar with it than I am with a Barbican at the moment. South of the river. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Wembley or Wimbledon? Um, gosh, that is, I would say Wembley. Wow. UCL or Kings? Oh, there's no argument here, Kings. <laughs> and that's not because I'm south of the river, that's because I'm a, uh, an independent governor at Kings. <laughs> okay, biased question. The Guardian or The Telegraph? Guardian. <laughs> I would say both, shouldn't I, really? political balance and all that, but not tonight. Okay, London is nothing if not diverse. I wonder if you'd tell us about an occasion when you realised you were in the minority, and I'd like to follow that up with another occasion when you understood yourself to be in the majority. It's interesting. Um, I suspect, Joe, you, you get asked a lot about being the only woman, and, and the church also often... Um, thinks about the fact that we have the monopoly sometimes on having not as many women represented as men in the ordained ministry or in leadership. 
But in fact, I've often been the minority throughout my working life, really. Um, so, you know, I was a poly nurse. They didn't, nurses didn't do degrees then, so I was in the minority then. And the truth is, as I moved through the health service, um, you know, I was the minority as a young woman uh, in, um, in leadership position. It was much often more men. And that was true about the Department of Health as well. There weren't that many men. Um, so there is a sense in which I've often found myself in a minority, but the, I guess the time that stands out to me was when I was a curate in Battersea Fields. Um, I was very conscious that um, the incumbent, Jeff, and myself uh, were in the minority because the major it was a parish, you can imagine, a very mixed diversity. Um, and I, I, you know, there was something fundamentally that I felt was difficult leading as a white woman in a church that was BAME, major, you know, majority. Um, and so for me, there was a sort of uh, inward um, desire to, to how do you enable people to come out of a community and then lead that community even within the church. Uh, and so it was great with the incumbent. We did some great things to enable, you know, church wardens to come from properly representative of the ethnic groups there, uh, and then one going on to be a reader, uh, lay minister. Uh, so that, in a sense, stands out in my mind as a time that I was wrongly in the minority. I, shouldn't, I, in a sense, shouldn't have been there. Somebody else better representing that community should be there. And what about an experience when you've been away, you've been in the majority? Um, I think, um, you know, that's, uh, there, it's interesting, isn't it, that I, um, I suspect the pattern of my life is that I often have been in the minority. But one that stands out for me was that um, I, you may be aware there's a program for women in the church called Le Leading Women, and it tries to enable and equip women in leadership roles. And I was very fortunate enough, you know, some, I suppose, seven or eight years ago to be invited on one of the first programs um, and um, so I went, and in Serum College in the chapel at Evensong, I was suddenly aware of the, almost the first time being just women. And there was a very profound moment when we came to sing. And uh, there, I don't, you know, for me that was very profound. You know, all the people, bar, the, bar that somebody that was leading it who happened to be a man, the rest of us were women. And that was very profound. And I felt then that sense of which actually, um, well, just the opportunity of the church in that group of women. And the, fact, the, the other thing for me I recognize is that also we sang differently. You know, we sing differently to men. So the reality for us is to understand with integrity uh, who God had called us to be. And I'm very conscious that my leadership is, is, is different to my, my male colleagues because there's, there's an integrity to whom God has called me to be. And so for me, that was very powerful, being in a group of women ordained in the church and, uh, in a sense, finding our voices. And what does it mean to engage minorities now in your mm. role called to be Bishop of London? Yeah, I mean, I'm very conscious. You know, London itself has something like 50% of the BME population in the country. 22% um, of its population is BAME. There are 300 languages spoken in London. And uh, in the Diocese of London, only 3% of our clergy come from BAME groups. Um, and um, if the church wants to engage with its community, uh, the church needs to represent its community. Uh, so one of my challenges um, is about how then do we enable our churches to represent that community. And so for me, very uh, consciously, uh, we need to do work around how we enable people to discern their vocation from BAME groups. And I do think one of our challenges, we often think that um, we need to enable them to fit our processes that they are today, that I think are probably tailored to white middle class uh, men. And actually, it's not about helping people get through that. It's about the fact that as a church, we need to be changed. Um, so I'm very conscious of the agenda in London uh, about BAME representation, uh, but also women, uh, only 13, well, I think it's gone up to 14% of women incumbents in the Diocese of London are women. Uh, and so there's something around the need for us to change that as well and to better represent. And 
the other thing I'm very, when you're standing here at St. Martin's, we were just talking, my um, maiden speech in the House of Lords was around um, the, I suppose, the, I can't remember the, quite the title, but it was how we enabled uh, disabled people in 2018. And I referenced the work that St. Martin's is doing around um, the wonderful work that you're doing around inclusivity and particularly around disability. Um, and I often reflect that as churches, our focus is so often around accessibility rather than how we need to be changed and, and changed by people with all their difference. Um, so I think we've got a long way to go in London. Thank you, that's really helpful. And again, in London, the, I'm interested to hear from your perspective what human struggles mm. more broadly perhaps you've encountered and their impact yeah i mean uh, you know L london's fascinating really i mean it is um you know there's such energy it's uh, you know such wealth but i'm also conscious that london can be fundamentally a lonely place uh, and um there's some awful figures you know that suggest that those people living alone uh, will double in the next, you know, uh, 15 or so years. So I'm conscious lone, it's a very easy place to be lonely in London, and that has real impact. Uh, the second area for me is having met with those that have been affected by uh, knife and gun crime uh, and mothers who have lost their sons. I can't imagine what that was like. And listening to both their bravery, but their willingness to speak to us, because actually for them, there is a question to the church, what are we doing um, to prevent more young men dying? Um, and for me, that uh, sits with me a lot of the time. And I was talking to one of the borough commanders in London who talked about the real challenge that we have. Um, the, the reason young people get involved in um, the county lines in running, running drugs is often because uh, the people they come to trust are the drug dealers. And so they are nurtured. They're the people they can trust, the people they go to. And this borough commander said, they're the people that teach them to shave. And I have to say that sits with me because um, you know, it is a challenge to us. Why aren't we, as church communities, engage in our communities so that we are the people that teach these young people to shave? Uh, and often offer some sort of difference in the future. Um, so it's always the personal stories. And I think, you know, that issue of homelessness, uh, loneliness, uh, violence is one that, as a church, I think we have a lot to contribute to changing, really. Thank you. When St. Paul arrived in Athens, he went straight to the Areopagus and he engaged the poets and philosophers of his day with the claims of Christianity. Where would you go in London and who would you seek to engage? Hmm. Uh, yes, as a Bishop of London, there's a wonderful list of uh, people that I uh, should engage with and meet with. And um, what's interesting is there are a lot of people who are willing to speak to the Bishop of London. So already I've had the opportunity, in a sense, to meet with the Lord Mayor, to meet with the Mayor, um, uh, to meet with borough commanders, you know, metropolitan police chiefs. Um, but actually for me, if as a church we're going to either, we're going to engage and transform both communities and society, whether it's through those sort of list of the powerful or through the Lord, then actually first and foremost we ought to be engaged with our community. So for me, um, you know, speaking to uh, you know, young people in schools, uh, speaking to those people who are homeless, engaged in homeless centres, uh, for me is first and foremost important because uh, there is a sense in which I don't want to be their voice, I want to give them voice. And I can only know how to do that if I've listened to them. Um, and the other thing for me is, uh, you know, I don't, wouldn't engage uh, in poetry, although I'd love to. Um, in terms of me being a theologian, somebody has said of me uh, that I am an intuitive theologian, uh, which I guess may be an insult in one way. Um, uh, but actually, there's something about plain speaking and engaging in a way that we are understood. Um, 
the senior staff in the London Diocese met with a group of millennials recently, so 18 to 25 year olds. And I was very struck, you know, they talked about how they see engaging with the church or not. And what they talked about supports all the research we know, you know, that young people want to talk about Jesus. Uh, they want to be in community, but don't know how to get there. And actually they want the church to be radical about the poor. And that was it. That was the brief sentence that they raised. And I was struck by all of the others of us wanted then to engage in some theological debate about it wasn't only Jesus, it's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the church isn't just community, and it's not in just incarnational. And actually, one of our challenges is that we have to learn the language of those people that we want to engage with. So there is something about simplicity, about listening to their language, and then engaging on their territory in their language. And in a sense, that's what I hope to do, really. Wonderful. Now, if, if I may, we're going to move on to encountering God. I'm interested to know where, if there is any pattern, do you encounter God in this city? Yeah, I mean... Um, I met with a group of people training for ordination really, and I, uh, recently, and I spoke to them about the importance of establishing patterns of spiritual life. Uh, and that's partly because, I, I mean, I grew up in an evangelical tradition. You know, prayer is a thread that runs through me. I pray and encounter God on a regular basis. But sometimes we hit those wilderness places, and therefore you need a discipline. And so for me, there's always morning and evening prayer. I loved it, would love to do it with others. I can't always do that. Um, so that's, in, in a sense, my framework. But in London, there is a sense that I encounter God in people. And that's why one of my greatest joys is going out and seeing what people are doing. I mean, I will listen and talk to anybody, really. Um, and so therefore, there's a sense that I encountered God in those places in London. That, for me, is a real joy. And, and one of the things that I think is different to my predecessor is that I travel on the tube, hence the tube, and that's my form of transport, is the tube, because it's quicker than bus. Um, and uh, there is nothing, you know, it's nothing more joyous for me about people engaging in conversation, uh, which they do with great regularity. Only this morning, uh, coming across the House of Lords, a couple of people chatting to me. So that, I encounter God in people often. I'm just tempted to ask, what's the balance between polite conversation and abuse on the tube? That's harsh, I know, but I bet it's real. Well, interestingly enough, I do find that um, if people engage you in a way um, that uh, they're going to be there for a little bit, it's usually polite, actually. Uh, I mean, they may have challenging questions, but most predominantly they are polite. Um, and I, you know, and I would say, since I've been in London, the majority of people are polite. I have to say, generally, if, I, if people are rude, it's usually done anonymously via another means. Uh, but on the two, uh, great conversations, actually. Uh, and I'm always surprised, which I probably shouldn't be, is the number of people who ask me to pray for them or to pray for somebody else. Yeah. So do you encounter God more in London than in Dartmoor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to tell you. Now, I have to, this is where Jo hasn't quite done her homework. I was the Bishop of Crediton, which is the east and oh, it's not north Dartmoor. of Devon. Oh, it's not dear. <laughs> That's a terrible mistake. Forgive me, people of Devon who are watching. <laughs> I have to make sure I get some of these things right, and I haven't forgotten them completely. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it, it, I suppose the, the, the bit that, um, where I did a lot of my struggle with God or my prayer with God was in Tiverton, which is where I lived. Um, there's a, a canal which doesn't go anywhere. It's 12 miles, doesn't go anywhere. Um, but I used to jog along it uh, quite often or walk my dog. Um, and I, that was often the place where I did that, um, you know, the hard work with God or if I'm struggling over something. Um, and, and what I learned, one of the things I learned along there was that actually sometimes I could be so caught up in my own head that I missed God. Um, and there was a wonderful, there were some wonderful kingfishers who live along there. And if I was so caught up in my own head, I'd miss the kingfisher and the flash of gold. And that taught me a lot. So for me coming to London, um, there is a bit how I replace that. And, and I have to say living uh, just near the Tower of London, there is a walk that I can do. Um, but what I find, because there are many more people, 
actually that face contact, you know, if, if I'm so caught up in my head, I miss the people. And often that's when people want, you know, people engage with me there. So I have learned um, that, you know, you have to change your pattern of living and life and your pattern of prayer wherever you are. And of course, Devon is a beautiful country and it speaks of, you know, the creation and of God's power and splendor. Um, you know, it is wonderful. Mm. So, Bishop Sarah, we, we worship the triune God. I'm interested to know if there's any one person of the Trinity that you relate to most readily. Now all the theologians are sitting down with their pens to see my answer. <laughs> an intuitive answer. My intuitive. You know, so yeah, I mean, my, you know, my real answer, um, you know, I suppose there's a bit for me that I encounter God. And there are moments when I, uh, I suppose I relate more to God, who's the Father, or God, the Son, or God, the Holy Spirit. So there, there are just moments that I, I'm very conscious of encountering part of the Trinity. Um, but I, in a sense, for me, uh, it is God that I encounter, I, I think. Mm. The whole of? The whole, yeah. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one, one yeah, three. I think that would be right. But there are obviously moments, you know, when... Uh, you know, moments when I, you know, see something that is just creative or something that is just compassionate or caring that I may think, well, that was the movement of the spirit. Or, or when I see, you know, um, some of those wonderful acts of compassion in our food banks uh, or on our credit unions, and I think, gosh, that is Christ incarnate. Um, or for me, that sense of... Um, just sacrifice, and you think, well, that's God the Father. So there are moments, but I, I often, I think I would often more think, more readily think of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one. Yeah. Now, you've just used the conventional language for the Trinity, yeah. Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm. I, I want to ask you if there's ever been an issue for you that that's conventionally male language? Uh, no, it hasn't, because I would probably think of the Spirit as being she. And I think, you know, of wisdom as being she. So um, I, there is a sense for me that I think Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is a mixture of it. But I think I would probably think of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So therefore, a mix of uh, he and she within that. Both genders rather than beyond would, gender. I mean, encompassing. Yeah, and it's interesting because I followed the debate uh, most recently in the uh, social media about that. Um, do I think of God beyond gender? I suspect that there is something of all of us who looks at God through our framework, um, and there is a sense of which that what we see in part now, we will one day see in full. So I suspect my interpretation of God I see within my earthly framework. And uh, for me, sometimes it's that bit about how do I catch the God that I have yet to encounter, and how do I know God that is unknowing? Um, uh, and so I suppose I'm, I am very conscious of my framework is a human framework full stop, whether it's about gender or anything else about God, really. Uh, and, I, and I do think one of our challenges is how do we open ourselves to God who is unknown but known. Yeah. And we're talking about encountering God very freely here. What, what would you say to any sceptics who are here tonight, sceptical of any religious experience? Um, I suppose the bit for me is that people, you know, um, you can always do the head stuff. Uh, and there's no way that I would convince people through the head stuff. It often is much through the heart. So I would say, come and see. Uh, and so I would want to uh, enable people to encounter uh, people and places and times where I think that they could encounter God. Um, and there is every evidence that people come to faith through relationships and it's through relationships of friends and families. And so there's something about those who are skeptic about how we would befriend them, how would we enable them to have a relationship for, for nothing else than us, them just encountering us, really. So it's that bit about come and see. Someone once said to me, while I was training, actually, that a good, uh, the capacity to be a good priest depends on one's experience of brokenness. I wonder what that says to you and perhaps if you're willing to share any experience of brokenness 
mm. that might have equipped <laughs> you in the industry? It's interesting. I was uh, somewhere recently on another public platform, and the pre-interview or chat, they wanted to sort of get to know me, and they went through asking me a number of questions. Clearly, I got a lot of ticks at the beginning, and then they asked me whether I'd had any life-changing traumatic experience. Uh, and I have to say, um, I had to say, well, I hadn't, you know, had I, you know, I hadn't really. And I, that was obviously a negativity. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, the, the truth is that I suppose I am very conscious of my humanness. Uh, I don't know what people see when they look at me. Um, I'm very conscious that they often, um, you know, may see me as a very strong, articulate woman of faith. Uh, but that's not what it always feels inside. Um, and I'm often conscious of my, well, my brokenness, really, in a very practical way. And uh, for me, one of the things that brought that home is that I've got dyslexia. And um, in a sense, as in, my, you know, in my career, that really hasn't affected me. You know, as a nurse, I always had to be careful taking a blood result down o over the telephone. Or if a relative gave me a number in which I would contact them if their relative deteriorated. So I was very conscious where it affected me, but it never really affected me until I uh, became a canon in a cathedral. And one of the things in the cathedrals you have to do is get all the words all in the right order. <laughs> and what I realised was in a parish church, people were very generous. And as long as you got the gist of the words there, they never really minded. Uh, and there was a lot of much more ad-libbing. But in a cathedral, you have to get all the words all in the right place. And the other wonderful thing is when you rock up at Evensong, uh, they would give you the reading to read you know so you'd turn up at you know 10 minutes before the service and they'd say read this reading and um you know there are what some wonderful words like prostate and prostrate which <laughs> <laughs> which is really, it's easy and you can considering my background the one i always had a tendency to and so that my friends my friends in the cathedral they would look at me as i came into the vestry and decide was i in a good mood or not <laughs> Uh, and was it worth a laugh or not, you know? Um, so I realised that, you know, um, and never before had I had that. You know, you give me a page and the words suddenly ran, around, ran away and I'd never had that. And for me, that was, um, you know, for, so for me, that was just a, you know, that became a real reminder of, you know, that was a real reminder of my, you know, humility really and brokenness. And the fact that, you know, it made me feel difficult also challenged the fact that maybe I'd love, you know, I like being a perfectionist and I wanted to get everything right. Um, and that stays with me, really. Um, so, yeah, so it's not a sort of, ma you know, sort of major thing in that way, but it is always there with me. And I can tell you, you know, uh, in this role, people listen to my every word and I am conscious when I don't get those words right. Um, and I suspect other people don't notice, but I do. So it, it's something I carry with me. I don't mind other people getting the words in the wrong order. It's always a great relief. Somebody's <laughs> going to ask you afterwards for a Bible reference for prostate. <laughs> uh, well, it's prostrate, isn't it? Like it. It's the one. Yeah. I can imagine prostate may be more familiar to the nurse. That's right, exactly than the right. American yeah. scholar. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Um, encountering church. Mm. Uh, Sarah, I haven't counted myself, but I think you are the 133rd Bishop of London. Would you like to recite 132? <laughs> no. Um, what, that's a big number. How does that sit with you? Well, it's interesting. Um, soon after the announcement, I found myself, because I happened to be preaching at one of the uh, Oxford colleges, and over sherry afterwards, they asked me who my favourite Bishop of London was. <laughs> I to tell you. And I, well, my answer was, well, 132, there are a lot to choose from. <laughs> but since then, I found out about one or two, uh, really. Um, and uh, what's interesting within this uh, long list, if anybody knows, uh, you, you know, you'll know, that they are all sorts of characters. And somebody asked me to review a book of um, faith in the city, really, and it covered a lot of these 132 um, bishops. And there's a whole, you know, they are so eclectic. You should see what some of them got up to, really. Um, but what's interesting, I suppose, I, the, the bit I came in, um, you know, there's a bit of me that just said, wow, you know, uh, that God... You know, God has called me, and um, my sort of 
My sort of uh, journey to the point at which I accepted uh, the calling uh, was always a bit unsure because, of course, they weren't going to appoint a woman to London. Uh, and maybe that gave me some assurance going forward in a process that they weren't going to appoint a woman to London. And there was a bit for me in my discernment that actually if I was asked, then that was part of my discernment because they weren't going to appoint a woman. And um, so I did, I just, in a sense, in the 132, I look in awe of them, really. But I did learn, um, but for me, there was something about, you know, I have a great belief that, God, belief that God calls particular people in particular times with particular gifts. Um, and, and I use a lot the call of Nathaniel, uh, because Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree. Um, and the fig tree is the place of God, actually. You know, it's the place of faithfulness to God. And of course, Philip called him and he wasn't that impressed to begin with, but eventually responded. And Jesus, um, in a, you know, said something to him. And Nathaniel says, how did you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. And there was this sense in which for me that being called, uh, you know, you know, there is a bit that in, in terms of God had been preparing this role for me. So I hold on to the fact that the God who has called me is faithful. Uh, and therefore, there is a sense in which God has called me at this particular time with my particular gifts for a particular purpose. And therefore, how do I, with the people of London, discern what God is doing at this time? Um, and, and that, in a sense, is a, a, a part of discovery. Um, and, the, the, you know, there are some wonderful characters. You know, the other bit I learned was there are some wonderful characters um, and the example I use quite often um, is um, Henry Montgomery Campbell. I think I've got the right name, Henry Montgomery Campbell. And he was sort of 1956, and he came from Guildford. He had been the Bishop of Guildford and was translated to London. And um, he, if you talk to people today, they still remember him because he was slightly wacky, but very pastoral. And when he came out of London, he, uh, out of Guildford to London, he said the only thing he could think that God was calling him to be is a pastor because that was his gifts. And what is clear is when you talk to people who remember him, they remember that he was a pastor. And in fact, that was what he offered at that time to London. So there is a sense for me that I do stand in awe of the 132, uh, and, but you know, the God who's called me is faithful at this particular time in this particular place with these gifts. So what's distinctive about being 133rd? And let me just ask, how might it differ from being the 33rd or the 333rd? Are, are we in the church? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I mean, it is a long legacy and, um, you know, what it does reflect for me is the long legacy of the Christianity within London uh, and there are often people you know I think uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury hasn't got quite as many Bif 105 you see it <laughs> or at least Bishop of London just don't last as long <laughs> and that may well be the case if you if you read this book you understand why there might be any <laughs> um, so I think in, in in that way there clearly is a long legacy and I think it speaks for me of a church um, you know one of the wonderful things about ordination services and licensing um, there are some wonderful words in it that says, along with all God's people, we are called to proclaim afresh the gospel in this generation. So for me, there's something about the fact that we have, you know, we have changed and we have to proclaim afresh in this generation something different. Uh, and the wonderful thing is Psalm 133rd is wonderful. It talks about anointing and about peacemaking and unity. Okay, I've got some more quick fire alternatives. Tea or coffee? Uh, coffee. Toddler group or lunch club? Oh gosh, both together. <laughs> <laughs> Organ or guitar? Organ. Howls or Palestrina? Howls. Actually, you don't have to get any further. <laughs> Early church father or Reformation martyr? Early church father. St. Benedict or St. Francis? At St. Benedict. Ah, oh, that's not a very smart answer. <laughs> you said these weren't, this wasn't a test. <laughs> and why St. Benedict? Oh, gosh, hospitality. My last one, Florence Nightingale or Edith Cavell? I know this is really uh, dodgy territory here, especially as it's being recorded. I could say uh, Mary Seacole. 
Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, uh, I mean, I trained at the Florence Nightingale School of Nursing, although I was a poly nurse. And I have to say that I sort of had a, a, a slightly love-hate relationship with uh, Florence Nightingale. And that's partly because my perception was framed with nursing. Um, and what I then discovered, she, Edith Cavell, was, was then became one of my real heroes, actually. And, you know, of course, she's around here somewhere, out here. Um, um, but then I discovered Mary Seacole. And Mary Seacole wasn't, in fact, a registered nurse. And, in fact, um, you know, she was much more of a sort of, you know, she, it was really much more around um, homeopathy and hospitality. But what she did do was she supported uh, nurses in the forces. Um, and for me, the, what I've now discovered more about Florence Nightingale is actually she really shouldn't be known for being a nurse. She was much more a statistician and an epidemiologist. You know, and we owe her for our sewage system here in London. And we owe her for um, our wards. And we owe her for hand washing. And we owe her for understanding the spread of infection. But of course, she, because she was a woman, we, ever, we only ever remember her because she was a nurse with a lamp. And so there's a bit for me that I've rediscovered Florence Nightingale. But I do feel that we lack um, sometimes role models that reflect the diversity of London, which is why often I will talk about Mary Seacole, because I think history didn't necessarily do her favours. And, and I watch sometimes debate around Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole, and actually there shouldn't be one or the other. There should be, in a sense, all three of them, because they offer us something as women. Thank you. Very inspiring. Now, does the, back to the church. Does the church in London, in its capital, have a different role to play than the church in other parts of the country? Well, the first thing I think that I have to say is that, in a sense, the church in London is uh, the church in London, Southwark and Chelmsford. <laughs> because I'm very conscious that the Diocese of London doesn't cover all of London. You know, it's north of the river, out to the River Lee, out to Staines and up to Enfield. Um, so, it's, um, so, in fact, it's a very specific diocese. Um, of course, at times, uh, the world will look at the church in London. Uh, and I'm also conscious that in the Diocese of London, I suspect we, more than any other diocese, reflect the diversity of the church tradition almost to the extremes. And that's partly because people can travel in London. So they would travel to the church where they feel most comfortable. Whereas out in Exeter, you can a bit, but not really. Um, so I do think there's something about the diversity of London and often people will look to the church in London and it speaks into it. Whether, whether that is right or wrong, that is the reality of it. Um, but I'm also conscious how much London diocese has to learn from the rest of the country as well. Mm. Very political. <laughs> well judged answer here. Okay. But it's, uh, it's also true. You know, it's interesting because I, I do, what I say, I do think we're very well resourced in the Diocese of London. Um, and whilst it may feel hard at times, we are well resourced. And I think there are some, you know, the challenges that we need to look at because of that. But at the same time, we, ha we have a lot to learn. I mean, I learned, you know, the Diocese of London is a growing diocese. The church is growing in Devon. Um, and what they've learned is that, in a sense, they've had a burning platform. They know their churches are getting less and less. In fact, the, di the Diocese of Exeter has 624 churches. In the Diocese of London, we only have 418, whereas our population is four times that. So you can imagine their church buildings. Um, and what they've learned, because they see, if they don't do anything else, they are stumped, that they have become very intentional about mission. Uh, it's really contextual, so that one village won't do the same as another village. And they have simplified what they do. They do simple things, and they've learnt they have to be, build relationships with their community. Um, and they've had to learn to work in teams, and they have enabled laity to flourish because they've had to. Now, my view, all of that is learning for London. You know, we should be doing exactly the same, being very intentional in our context, making it simple, building relationships with our communities, learning to work in teams and releasing our laity. Um, so I think we've got a lot to learn, as well as maybe things to give. Um, 
you know, we train more curates here than any other diocese. We train uh, more ordinands and can't place them in curacies, and then we can't take all our curates. Much better to work with those dioceses who can't afford to train curates. And to say, rather than, you know, it just saying, well, work it out yourselves, why don't we work with them and enable our, the curates we're training to think about, well, maybe they are called to ministry in Exeter or Newcastle. So there are some things that we ought to give, but also recognise we've got a lot to learn. Thank you. I'm interested to know, as you engage and encounter church, probably about 10 a day, I'd love you to tell us about something recently that sent you home humming with joy. You know, what, what feeds you in terms of your encounters, with, apart from your latest visit to St. Martin's? <laughs> Apart from this one, yeah. Um, yeah, I was out in, uh, I was out in uh, Ealing recently, and it was a synod, and you may think, oh, synods aren't exciting. This was great. Um, but what really sent me humming was we, uh, there was a service beforehand, and um, there, were, there was just wonderful, because at the service there were school children there, the school came in, did the intercessions, which would be normal for them. Um, they were great, they were young people engaged in a bit of an ad hoc way. They weren't walking in straight lines and things, but it was joyful. And these children uh, just loved being there, really. Um, and it was great. That, that, for me, was brilliant. You know, there were children in church, they were engaged, and they were having fun, which, for me, was just great, really. That was good. Mm. Um, your sense of vocation to the priesthood seems to have developed during your time as a nurse. I'm just wondering how that might be related, one vocation and the other for you. Um, so, yeah, I, I say, and, and you may have heard it or seen it written, that in a sense I've only had one vocation. Uh, my vocation was always to follow Jesus Christ. I became a Christi Christian as a teenager, and then I had that question, what do you want, you know, what do I do? And, and of course, at the time, they didn't ordain women, but, um, uh, but I felt called to be a nurse. It was, that, it was about caring people. It was being Christ's hands in the world. Um, it was sitting in those difficult places, bringing life and wholeness and life in all its fullness. So for me, that was a vocation. Um, and, you know, often people, you know, often the church has this struggle and feels that we're bringing management into the church. Well, the truth is I learned to be a leader in the secular world in a way that was underpinned by my knowledge of God and my theology. So for me, what I did was living out my vocation to follow Christ. And that was both as a nurse and as a manager and as the government's chief nursing officer. Um, and along that journey, um, God in a sense, called me into something else. So it is, it's always been one vocation. And of course, I am the bishop today because I was a nurse. Um, you know, when I was at Salisbury Cathedral at the end of a service, because there are always excess clergy at cathedrals, we'd sort of stand up at the end to shake people's hands. And, you know, they would, often people would leave and they would ask this deep theological question of my colleague. And then they would come to me and ask them, me about their varicose ulcer. And um, now I know nothing about varicose ulcers before you all queue up at the end. Um, but the reality is that they were engaging with me in a different way. And therefore, you know, I am the bishop I am because of all that, really. And, um, and so there is a sense in which I've had one vocation. And clearly that has all shaped me for the bishop I am today. Yeah. So that takes us nicely to talk about leadership. Uh, and, and I just would love to push you a bit further on the sort of bilingualism you've referenced about being a sort of chief operational organizational officer and being a priest theologian. Is that, are those two different languages? And if so, how do you, how do you work heavenly things and earthly things together? Well, interestingly, in, in when I was um, nursing and, uh, you know, either a director of nursing or a chief executive or the, the chief nursing officer, I, um, I did quite a lot of reflection upon mo the model of my leadership. Um, and in fact, that had all its roots in scripture. And in fact, at the time, we were using something in nursing um, um, by, and I think it was Peter Greenleaf, but it was a servant leader. 
And whilst his background was as a Roman Catholic, he was speaking into the public sector around leadership. And it was that model of servant leader, of uh, enabling and facilitating others, putting others before yourself, um, living in the service of others. So there is, for me, my model of leadership came out of my understanding of the model of Christ. That's where it absolutely was rooted for me. Um, and so the way I engage with people was based on my understanding of the incarnation. Um, so, you know, I absolutely had to have lots of difficult conversations, but I did that in a way that was always humble and respectful, that always tried to enable them to find their self-value and their self-worth. So in a sense, um, for me, how I led was just was because of who I was as a Christian and the work, almost that work I had to do then outside the church. So coming into the church, um, there has been a continuity for me. And in a sense, the language I use as a nurse is the language that I use now because it was always based uh, in, in scripture for me. But I'm guessing you spend quite a lot of time organizing stuff rather than just, rather than engaging people. I don't know whether that's sitting answering email or, or, or planning the strategy for London Diocese or, and I'm just wondering, the desk work relative to engaging children in the school in Ealing you just spoke of, is there a tension? Yeah, of course there is. <laughs> you should ask Francis who does my diary. <laughs> I'm very grateful to her. I mean, you know, um, gosh, you know, people often ask me, what can they pray for? And I say wisdom, and I mean wisdom in the right, widest sense, wisdom of words, but also wisdom of how I use my time. Because what I use my time for reflects on what I see as important. Um, and there is, you know, I have more requests than I could ever fulfill, really. Um, and for me, it is important, um, so I, you have to get that right. And the other bit for me is this whole sense of, well, what do I bring to the Diocese of London? And I'm very lucky, you know, we have a College of Bishops. So the bit for us to work out is who does what? We don't have to do it all. And what is the bit that I bring? And what actually should I not be doing? What should I stand back from? And six months in, you know, I don't believe... I don't believe I've got that balance right yet, but it's something that I would hope to um, balance, really. And I do think my, uh, you know, one of my key things is, question, there are a few quick key questions I have. Actually, if this isn't about, if I, what I'm doing, whatever it is, isn't about people or about what I believe that we're doing as the kingdom of God in the Church of England in London, then why am I doing it? The second thing is, actually, is there somebody better to be doing this? Do I, is it really, can I really only do it? So they have become two sort of key questions for me in what I do. Um, but of course, no, I haven't got it right. Um, and, it's, and yes, it's always a tension. Mm. Thank you. A CEO I was speaking to recently said to me that he thought he was doing really well if he got six out of 10 things right. <laughs> I wonder how that feels to you, and if so, what one does with the four out of ten? Well, it's an interesting thing that you know you've got something right. I mean, how do you, you know, I mean, that is a question for me. How will I know that I've got something right? Um, you know, one of the things I learned in government, that so often in government we weigh up policies, and um, the truth is there's never the, you know, it's never the right way forward. It is only the best given the information you have. You make the best decision you can on the information you have. There's not a right and there's not a wrong. And sometimes then you watch government and they come out and say, you know, this is the right one. But we all know that it was just the best. And, and there's a, um, so there is a sense in which, how do I know whether I've got it right or wrong? I don't. What I, what I hope to do is to do the best given the situation and the information that I have. Um, and I suppose the issue for me is that I know that I'm likely to get lots wrong. Because, um, in a sense, I was an unusual appointment, I think I carry with me a huge amount of expectation. People project onto me their expectation. So because I'm a woman, you know, they therefore expect me to solve all these other problems. Um, you know, I'm, I'm bound to disappoint, actually. I have to tell you, I'm bound to disappoint. And David Runcorn has written a book called Trust and Fear. And in that, he talks about um, 
I think it's the discovery of self is when you walk away. And so there is something that I recognise that at some point I have to have the confidence to walk away from people's expectations of me because that's the only moment that I will find the real self that God has called me to be. And so there is something for me about uh, keeping close to God to try and hear what it is that he's really calling me to do, which might not be right or wrong, but is just the best thing at this time in this place. Um, so yes, I, I'm not, you know... I. I yeah, I mean, I'd hope to get four things right out of ten, actually. <laughs> but how do you do? <laughs> yeah, I would be pleased with it. Okay, I think this is my last question, and then we'll uh, open, open things up. Um, when I was training for ordination, which is about 26, 28 years ago, the movement for the ordination of women was still gathering steam, and uh, I heard voiced all over the place so many of our church's problems would be resolved if we could ordain women. I'm interested to know uh, what's resolved. <laughs> oh, gosh, you know... Uh, what problems have gone away? <laughs> I don't know, maybe others have come. I mean, we're, we're pilgrim people, aren't we? And uh, we walk together as people of the way, uh, journeying with God and into God. Uh, and um, there is a sense in that we're part of that journey. And, I, and of course, I do believe things have changed. Um, and it may well be in the changing, we've replaced them with other tensions. It has to be better that we begin to reflect um, our communities better. But I'm also conscious that, you know, our appointment doesn't solve the issues. Um, and I'm conscious that, you know, even in, I mean, I think in London, uh, I've had a very good reception. Uh, we've worked some of those complexities out around the London plan, around those, you know, and there are some, you know, 14% of um, incumbents are women. Um, you know, 12% of incumbents would not accept my ordination as a priest. Um, and we've worked out a way in the London plan, uh, which I think has been very positive. But actually, that doesn't resolve some of those issues at a very local level about parishes bumping alongside each other where there is a woman incumbent and maybe forward in faith or a conservative evangelical parish. So those things aren't necessarily resolved yet. But I do think that we are on this journey. And therefore, you know, I'm very grateful to, to those who have enabled me to be here and for us to at least travel some of that journey. But I wouldn't underestimate how much further we have to go. Thank you, Bishop Sarah, very much. Indeed. Thank you. If I go um, talk the issue about, um, I suppose, how we identify God, uh, and I touched on this a little bit, I think one of our risks is that we often portray, portray God through our... Um, our framework of thinking. So, so therefore, you know, and we get, so for example, you only have to look at the images of Jesus, you know, often portrayed as white European. Um, you know, we have, a, I think, a whole legacy of how we interpret God through our framework, whether it is gender biased or whether it is, you know, about race or class, a whole series of things. Um, and therefore, one of our challenges is around how we enable people to encounter God uh, in new and different ways. Now, for me, as I said before, you know, I, I see God as a God, which is in a sense Father, Son and Holy Spirit, which, uh, you know, uses both the gender female and male, because that is in the, con you know, that is where we are, that is what we have. Uh, and there is a sense in which that I hope that uh, we find way, different ways to experience God um, through different means and in different ways that uh, sometimes, you know, doesn't involve gender. You know, for me, creation tells me something about God. You know, uh, you know the beauty of the buildings here do. Um, so I think that, that we have to be open to it. But I do recognise that the way we interpret God does enable people, well, it, it disables people at some times. And therefore, we have to be very conscious of that.
In terms of feminist theology, you know, it's interesting. I probably, uh, you know, and my daughter would probably smile at this. I don't, in a sense, see myself um, as a feminist, you know, in, in that way, really, uh, within theology. But what I do believe is that um, it is absolutely right that we recognize the role of women uh, within the church because it reflects the nature of God. Um, and we have to see that, you know, God was made, you know, both man and woman, made in his image. Uh, and therefore the church needs to reflect that. Um, but the reality is that we have taken time to get here. And I'm conscious uh, that that has been evolving over time. And many of us would have liked it sooner than not. But that's where we are. And to be celebrated. You know, people often ask me, what is the biggest challenge the Church of England faces? Um, the biggest challenge the Church of England faces is the Church of England. Um, <laughs> and um, I say that because, you know, we, do, we live in a world where um, increasingly lesser people, less people would... Uh, affiliate to being a Christian, let alone a member of the Church of England. But what uh, people do is they, they will still talk about being spiritual. Um, and as I indicated, every indication is that young people do want to talk about God, and they certainly want to be involved in social justice, and they want to be part of community. Um, and our challenge is to engage with them, in a sense, on their turf, wherever that is, because increasingly, we live in a generation where, um, you know, parents don't come to church, so therefore the young people won't come to church. And therefore, there is a sense in which they won't come through these doors. Um, so how do we enable the church to speak confidently uh, about God in a way that young people would engage? And I do think that is a challenge for us. Um, and that's about, you know, so for example, in London, you know, we, we talk about ambassadors and we talk about youth ambassadors. And it is about how we enable people to engage in that more confident way with, as you say, issues that face them. And uh, the reality is that you will know that there is, as, uh, you know, there is a great diversity of views in London about issues of sexuality uh, within the church. Uh, and as I said, you know, in a sense, London Diocese reflects the diversity of the Church of England. Um, and certainly I believe that people could find a church within London that they could be at home with. But um, I, won't, um, you know, I won't avoid the issue that the Church of England faces this discussion, and you will well know it. Uh, and interestingly enough, both, and, both Joe and I are on groups that try, are trying to engage in that dialogue at the moment. And my view is that you know, I talk about wisdom. If anywhere, that's where the church needs wisdom. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to, to pray for that. Well, interestingly enough, I suspect um, that, you know, if, I were, if you were to ask me the question, who recently have I brought to faith, it would be a man, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I recognise that um, we all, you know, that, that often it is... You know, women, uh, people come to faith through friends and families. And often those conversations that people have about something that is often deep is often with somebody of the same gender. You know, women talk about, you know, that's not wholly true, but it is true. So, so therefore, I have no issue, you know, with women's coffees morning or with men's breakfast, you know. That's fine with, with me. Um, uh, you know that's that's absolutely fine. It's not it's not an issue. Um, but I uh, but but at the same time, there are times when actually you men are just as equally good at bringing women to faith as women are. But I do feel, and one of the things that I um, reflect on um, is that, and I don't know whether Joe has this as well. But I, uh, one of the things I did not expect when I was consecrated as a bishop, I did not expect it, was the number of women who came up to me. And they were affirmed because I was consecrated as a bishop. They were affirmed. And women who were not in the church, 
who, for whatever reasons, you know, felt that actually because I had been consecrated as bishop, they would retry church again. I had not envisaged that in one way, or I just, it hadn't dawned on me that would happen. So there is for me a sense of responsibility with that as well. So what am I doing with nurturing women as much as men? One of the other wonderful things that I get, there's, a, there's a people often cautious, particularly in London, about me being a woman, about how I will be received by those of other faith. I have to say that other faith leaders have no problem with me. Um, and what I find, though, is the real joy, particularly of those faiths where often there is segregation of men and women, I also get the chance to go and speak with the women. And for me, that has proved really powerful because that has meant that I have enabled to talk to them and give them value and empower them. So to talking to the men and the women have been great, which maybe had been excluded if you'd been a man. Can I just jump in? Mm. As, as somebody who went to a single-sex school, uh, there's a place for, for being apart and being in our specialist groups, whether that's about race or or gender or sexuality, but if we believe in diversity and its inherent value, and I think God believes in diversity because God created it, and uh, at, the, at the final throne when we worship together in heaven, they talk of every tribe and tongue and nation. You know, we're not going to be sort of shades of grey. I, I think the diversity will be retained. There's something really important about being in a mixed environment, mixed in all kinds of dimensions, and learning together from that, even where it's difficult, even where there's conflict, even where there are painful conversations. And I think it's in just those kind of encounters that we begin almost to complexify, but to enrich our understanding of God. I think it's necessary. No, I agree with that. And actually, just coming back to, because I was thinking about the question about the feminist theology, because um, the other thing that I'm very conscious of, and, I, and I've done it this evening, so the piece of scripture I used was of, uh, of, of Nathaniel, which does mean something to me. But the other thing we often do is we talk about male figures out of the Bible. Um, and in fact, one I could have equally used is Esther. So there's a wonderful part in Esther where um, she is, you know, she's trying to work out why is it that God has called her to be queen at this moment. And there's a wonderful passage that says, for such a time as this. And um, I do use that as well. So one of my other things is our responsibility to equally use images of, of those parts of scripture that, to, that well, there are women role models as there are men. We often, uh, you know, default to men, and I did it this evening. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. I do think um, there is something about how we, when we encounter people, we are changed. And I think the church uh, needs to learn from the conference that I know went on at the weekend uh, and how we replicate that across the church. I absolutely agree with that. And that's really encouraging. In terms of the uh, question about gay marriage, um, as I said that at the moment the position of the Church of England is that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, and there is a process that's going on that's called Living in Love and Faith, and I chair one of those groups, uh, which is the group around social and biological sciences. Uh, and for me, that has been a real privilege, and it is about um, faithful exploration. Um, and I, what I have made is a commitment that because I am chairing that group, um, for me there isn't a personal comment on that at the moment, uh, because I think that it, you know, for me, uh, I am in a process of li listening. Uh, in terms of the question from the young ladies, <laughs> in terms about the mitre, uh, and, uh, and the crozier, and whether the formalities feel more masculine. I mean, of course, you know, up to now there have only been male bishops. Um, and uh, I don't know about Joe, but one of the interesting things is I do think the mitres were designed for men without hair. And, uh, <laughs> and, and does the fringe go under or out? And, you know, um, you know and um, 
you know, so it is, it is a sort of challenge, you know, it is, a, yes, it is a little bit of a challenge, really. And the wonderful thing about the, um, the crozier I was using the other evening was the travelling crozier. The crozier at St Paul's, for those that have seen me, it is really heavy. It looks as heavy as it, you know, it is as heavy as it looks, actually. And there's a whole balance thing with it and the height. Um, but, but um, so there is a bit, you know, uh, tradition has its place, um, you know, it has its place. I sit slightly lightly on it, um, as some people may note uh, around it. When I do use the crozier and the mitre, I sit lightly on it. But it is important, and I, and I think also one of, the, I think one of the challenges that we have as women um, is, is the fact of how do you... So, so I'm pretty, you know, I sit pretty lightly on it, and, and therefore I'm happy to be called Sarah or Bishop Sarah or whatever you'd prefer. So I sit lightly on all that. But at some point, there is the important role of the Bishop of London. Um, and so for me, there is always this tension between that formality and my informality. Um, and how do I, you know, how do I manage that? And I don't always get that right. But one of the wonderful stories is that um, in, in terms of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, often people, uh, when they are installed or have been consecrated, they have a new cope made, which is the cloak bit. Uh, and if you Google me, you'll see it. Um, and um, for me, sometimes that's quite hard because it's expenditure, it's money. What, you know, what, where would I prefer money to be spent? On a cope or for the poor? I know where I'd prefer. Um, so in fact, I had a conversation with St. Paul's about my installation cope, and I really just said to them, you must have one in the cupboard I could use. Um, and in fact, what was interesting was that they had already uh, been making a cope for a woman because it does need to be slightly set on the shoulders in a different way. Now, they, they didn't imagine they'd be waking it for a woman bishop, um, so, which is a wonderful story. So, in fact, there was a cope at St. Paul's that fitted me better than it might have done. But the mitre, if you go and look at it, is beautifully sparkly and blue. I mean, it's very pretty, the one I wore. And somebody said to me, isn't that a wonderful feminine mitre? Um, and it is, but I have to tell you, it was adapted from Bishop Richard Charters. <laughs> I, I bet they never said that to him. <laughs> so we may conclude someone had a bigger head. <laughs> I just said adapted. I didn't say which way. <laughs> We're coming to an end now, but on your behalf, I'd like to thank both of our speakers tonight. When we went to the installation at St. Paul's Cathedral of Bishop Sarah, I and I'm sure a lot of other people saw the beauty and pomp and circumstance and all those copes and finery of St. Paul's Cathedral and thought, God, this is a big job to be taking on. And we all felt a bit frightened, well, I did, for anyone taking on a diocese like this. But what we saw in Bishop Sarah was someone of honesty, simplicity, grace, and naturalness, someone who was comfortable to speak their own truth with a wisdom that was not high up in the clouds, but was our wisdom and our truth, the truth that we could join and share with. And I think all of us have witnessed that tonight. So on your behalf, I'd like to thank Bishop Sarah for answering those many questions with such wisdom and grace. Thank you, Bishop Sir. Fambanaye, no 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 f